So I turn, I put my MC hat back on, and um, I would now like to invite my colleague to come up and speak with you. So Susanna's going to talk. Sorry, my mistake. I've jumped ahead here. I'm going to introduce another colleague from the European Research Council. Is Dr. Martin Penny, who's the head of Europe for uh, physical sciences and engineering at the European Research Council. This is one of the most prestigious funding programs uh, offered by Europe. I think it'll be a name probably known to many of you already. And Martin will, will tell you uh, how the program works and what calls are coming up and, and how you can be successful in that program. Martin? Yeah. Good morning. Bear with us a second whilst we get the slides up and running. Okay. As Simon said, my name is Martin Penny, and I'm here to talk to you about the European Research Council. Now, we've already heard a lot about the fact that this is a whole event about why you may want to work in Europe. And I hear already that many of you are in the process of considering or actively taking steps to work in Europe. So I'll skip over that. I don't think I need to explain um, why it could be interesting for a few to, to work in Europe. We heard in the introduction about the importance of working globally in tackling many of the, the big challenges and problems that our societies face. And so the need for international networking and cooperation is really important. It was also mentioned in the introduction the importance of fellowship programs and collaborative programs. And actually, we're neither. So what I'd like to, to do is spend some time explaining, for those of you who don't know, what the European Research Council is, what we're about, and why I'm here today talking to you about the ERC. Now, the ERC stems, has a long history, but is essentially set up according to demand from the research community themselves for the need to have a funding scheme in Europe which allows to fund researchers purely on the excellence of their research idea. No need for collaboration, no need for any other political or any other criterion other than we want to fund the very best researchers irrespective of their nationality and have them work for at least part of their time in Europe. So it's as simple as it sounds. Any researcher from anywhere in the world can apply. Simple process, one researcher with one great idea a host institution, which is an organization in, in Europe, one of the 28 member states, or one of the now, it's actually 15 countries which are associated to the framework program, which are other countries in Europe which buy into the program, if you will, and one selection criterion that your project will be judged on, which is purely excellence. That's the only way in which it's put in place. So the ERC has been established since 2007, has rapidly built up um, a reputation as being the prestigious, the most prestigious funding body in Europe, and certainly already we will see um, many international organizations from outside Europe who, when they're looking to recruit researchers, will actually get a list of our grantees and say, actually, this could be a person that we'd want to, uh, we want to take. So that gives you an idea of what we're about. It co we cover research in any area of research, so all areas of physical sciences and engineering, which is my my part of the ERC, in life sciences, and in all areas of social sciences and humanities. I'll give you a little bit more detail about the opportunities as I move on. Formerly, we fall under the Horizon 2020 program. We have about 17% of the budget of Horizon 2020. To put that in figures, it's about 2 billion euros a year over the, over the period of, of Horizon 2020 falls under the excellence pillar of Horizon 2020 for those who, who are interested or know about those types of things. But what we do, as I say, is allow you, all of you have great ideas, I'm sure, of the research project which you'd like to put forward. And that's essentially what we'd like to see. We allow you to choose the topic, completely free to choose any topic in any area of research, and to design a research program for up to five years. You need to then work with a host institution in, in Europe who's willing to host you. I can guarantee that 
there'd be, it'd be very rare for any host institution in Europe if you'd say, I'd like to apply for a European Research Council grant, would you be interested in hosting me? They know the size of the, these grants and also the prestige of these grants. You'll find it easy to find a host institution. The grants are fairly substantial, so it allows you the financial autonomy to develop your research idea, to recruit or to extend your research team. And also, because of the label of the ERC grants, it allows you to attack, attract very much top talent, so top leading PhD students or postdocs to come and work with you. We also ensure that these grants, although you're working with a host institution, are as personal as possible. So it could be that maybe you started to work um, in one of the, the, the institutions in the CNRS in France. And then you've worked with that, worked for a couple of years as part of your grant, and realized that actually where you really need to work for a particular piece of, in, uh, particular piece of infrastructure could be uh, working um, at the, the University of Cluj in, in, uh, in Romania. We allow you to take your grant with you. So it is very much a, a grant which is portable and which can be taken forward. So let's summarize. Who can apply? Any of you. I think it's as simple as that. Researchers from any nationality, any age, any current place of work with an excellent idea. All you need to do is have that idea and find the institution that you'd like to work with in Europe. We require that our researchers spend at least 50% of their time in Europe. So some of those of you who are thinking, I already have a full-time post here. Can I combine the two? Yes. You need to make sure that 50% of your time is in Europe. The other 50% of your time can come here, could be here. We also allow that if you want to move some of your research team here, from here to your European host, I'll come on to that. There's funding which is available for it. So what types of grants do we give? When the European Research Council was set up, to make sure that it really is an organization which was run for researchers, by researchers. The governing body is known as the Scientific Council. Although formally we're part of the European Commission, we, we're not responsible, we don't fall under the, the responsibility of the European Commission. They have handed, handed that over to the Scientific Council. And this Scientific Council is a group of 24 top researchers from all around the world who are selected by an independent peer review for a short-term basis. They tend to be between four and eight years on a rolling basis. And they set up the whole principles through which we are funded. They decide where the money is going to go, how it's going to be offered, what types of funding opportunities are going to be there, how much money we can give to it for each of the grants. All of that is decided by the research community because they know what you need better than, than a group of bureaucrats like myself. So what the ERC has decided, what the Scientific Council has decided, is that the majority of the money, about two-thirds of the money, should go to researchers that are in the earlier part of their career. And for that, we call them our starting grantees and our consolidator grantees. Starting grantees are those who are between two and seven years after having completed their PhD. Now, of course, some people have unconventional career paths. They may have taken time out to work in industry. <coughs> Excuse me. You may have taken time out to have a family. You may have had, uh, taken time out for other reasons. If that's the case, that eligibility window is extended for the time that you've taken out. Now, starting grantees can apply for a grant of up to one and a half million. Um, and that's one and a half million euros over five years. So a very substantial grant for somebody who wants to launch their research career. It'll allow them to, uh, to recruit several PhD students or several postdocs and really develop this idea that they've always had with the staffing they need for it. The next step, the next type of grant is consolidator grants. Consolidators are a little bit more advanced in their academic career um, or in their research career that you're between 7 and 12 years after your PhD. And again, that window can be extended if you've had unconventional career paths. Consolidators can apply, it for, apply for up to 2 million euros. Um, and again, it's for grants of up to 5 years. The third types of grants are for everyone else. People who are more advanced in their career, 
Um, and there, you can apply for up to 2.5 million euros, again, over five years. There's one other scheme which I'll just touch on briefly, um, which is for our grantees. This is the proof of concept scheme here, here at the bottom. Now, this is not a, a scheme which is open to everybody. It's only open to the people who already have one of our grants. But the idea behind that is within our grants, of course, people were developing ideas which may change the world in 10 years' time, in 50 years' time, in 100 years' time. But some of them will also be developing ideas which may be changing the world right now. And they want to get some additional financing to look at the feasibility of how they get this on the market. And so we offer, um, we offer small grants to put, to put in place the initial steps of the feasibility of some of these great ideas. But this is only open to our actual grantees. So why am I talking to, to you about it? Well, currently, we've only had nine applications from Thai researchers. And overall, only between, um, only between 10 and 15% of our grantees come from outside Europe. And we don't believe that only 10 to 15% of the best ideas in research come from outside Europe. And so I'm here to spread the message to say that this is something which is for you. If you want to, to move to Europe, to move your, your research career to Europe, or if you want to combine your research career with a period of, of stay in Europe, either working 50% in Europe, 50% in Thailand, this could be a, a scheme for you. Now, we allow for the fact that if you want to move to Europe, there's going to be additional costs which come for it with that. It could be that you need to build your laboratory if you're a lab-based scientist, or you need certain pieces of equipment which you're not sure your host organization in Europe have. You may have them here in Thailand and it's difficult to move that equipment, it needs to stay here. Or you may have people currently working for you that you'd like to bring with you and, current, and work, and sure they continue to work with you in your European host. So in each of the grant competitions, there's additional funding which you can apply for to allow for these setup costs or for these transfer costs for an extra half a million for the starting grantees, three quarters of a million for the consolidators, and an extra million for the advanced grantees. And of course, we recognize that if you're moving to Europe and you have a PhD student who's working on the area that you want to work on, and they may be in their final year of their PhD, probably the worst thing you can do to that poor PhD student is to force them to move to, to Europe. Um, you'd prefer them they stay where they are, or you'd like to have some of your team based in laboratories outside Europe, you can. You yourself need to be 50% of your time uh, in Europe at least, but your team members can be based outside Europe as well. So I hope I've whetted your appetite and we'll get a few more than nine um, applications from Thailand. So what do you have to do? Well, the first thing is in here. The first thing is having this great idea it's a very competitive, very uh, prestigious grant. And so these really are the ideas which are going to change the, the, the way in which we, are, we live our lives, we work, uh, we, you know, our health systems and, and, and so on. We tend to use the word frontier research. And the reason why we talk about that is this is not just basic research, it's not applied research, it could be either. We don't really mind whether it's something which is at technology readiness level zero or technology readiness level eight. You know, we don't mind where on the scale of application it is. We use the term frontier research because we want you to push back the frontiers of our current knowledge. We don't mind if it's basic or applied. It's really you putting forward a really truly groundbreaking idea. So, so you have that idea, you develop the feasibility of it, you develop the research project, and you ensure that you have an institution in a European Union country or an associated country um, that you can get the support of when you're writing your application. So that's it. You write your application and submit it within the deadline. I'll come on to the deadlines shortly. So what actually happens once we've, rec once we've received your application is they're all evaluated, as you'd imagine, by international peer review. So very much the top uh, researchers around the world will evaluate your research proposal. And who chooses these researchers? 
If you remember, I talked about the Scientific Council, these 24 really lead, world-leading scientists um, who um, set out our, our whole governance structure and the way in which we fund research. They also choose the peer reviewers for the, uh, for the, for the evaluation panels. So you can be sure that these are really, truly the experts that will be looking at your research proposals. Proposals are evaluated in two steps in the same way that you prepare your application in two parts. We ask that you prepare the full proposal and then a self-standing short version of the proposal. And I use my words carefully. It's not a summary. It needs to be fully self-standing, but just a shorter version of the proposal. And in the first step, we ask the evaluators to look only at the shorter version of the proposal. If they are convinced by that, will take you through to the second step. And in the second step, they will look at both the long version, the full version, and this shorter version. And also, they will ask further peer reviewers. They will, the panels will look for who are the real world experts in this particular research topic, and will ask them for an additional review, which they'll provide into the evaluation panel. Now, one of the things which the Scientific Council has put in place as well and it's quite unique in terms of research funding, is we recognize that often when you're at your early stage of your career, it's sometimes difficult to really get the excitement or the clarity or you into, into, into a paper-based proposal. So at step two, we interview every single candidate that's got through to step two um, for starting and consolidator grants. So you'd be invited to come to Europe. If you cannot travel, we can do interviews by video conference. But the panels will interview every single candidate uh, for a half hour interview with a presentation and questions so that they can be sure that we're really funding the very best people and they can hear directly from you your enthusiasm for the research, your reasons why you've put together this research proposal and why it's important for you and why it's important in pushing back the frontiers of knowledge. For ease of evaluation, we've divided the whole of research into 25 panels. So you'll see, you'll probably find a panel which immediately relates to, to your area of research. Now some of them are very broad panels, some of them are narrower panels, it reflects the numbers of proposals that we receive. In life sciences we receive more proposals the panels are slightly narrower in scope. Don't worry if you look at a title and think, well, I could fit under one or two. There's a lot more guidance given to how you direct your proposal to a panel. And what's more important is we know who the evaluators are. And so you're, if you're looking at this saying, well, I'm working in an area, um, I don't know, of, of material science, which actually is going to be very useful for medical implants. So am I working in... Um, synthetic chemistry and materials, or am I working in uh, diagnostic tools? Am I in P8 or LS7? That doesn't matter. You can indicate both, but we know who is in the, the we know the, the, who are the members of the peer review panels, and we'll make sure that your proposal is directed to the most appropriate panel for you based on the expertise behind those. But this is just purely to give you a guidance of the areas and how we evaluate. How you apply? Very simple. Scientific Council knows that the first thing which researchers hate doing is you hate filling in forms. We all hate filling in forms. So there's only three forms. It's as simple as we can. And they're as simple as who you are, who the organization you want to work in Europe is, and tell us a little bit about the budget that you're wanting. The rest of it is about your ideas. So set out in this, these two parts the full version of the proposal, which we call the B2, and this short version of the proposal, the B1. This annex is there making sure you have the support from the, um, from the host institution. And if you're applying for a starting, grantee, starting grant or a consolidator grant, we need a copy of your PhD certificate to make sure that you're eligible. You're within that two to seven or seven to 12 year period since you've finished your PhD. So it's as simple as that. And what do these peer review panels evaluate on. Like I said, one criterion, excellence. There's nothing on collaboration, there's no political criteria, there's nothing on will this research be used. It's purely the excellence of the research idea you've had and your excellence. 
Simple as that. Nothing else that they will look at. There's no hidden criteria at all. So, when can you apply? These are the, the deadlines. So for advanced grants, we're currently, as you'd imagine, we're into 2016. We're spending our 2016 budget. So the deadlines for the 2016 calls for starting and consolidated grants are already uh, away. Actually, interestingly, we have one of the Thai, Thai researchers who's in the second step of uh, one of our evaluations for starting grants. So the 2016 grant that's available is for advanced grants, but we'll so shortly be starting the process for the 2017 budget year. And you can see already that the, uh, the call for starting grants will be opened in July with a deadline of October of this year, consolidator a little bit later. And then we come through to next year's advanced grants competitions then. So if you don't believe me about the success of, uh, of the ERC, I, after nine years, I think we can truly say that this is a prestigious funding program. We fund about, funded 6,000 uh, researchers um, so far, many of whom um, have either already had Nobel Prizes before they became a researcher or gained Nobel Prizes and field medals after they received one of our, of our grants. We have had over 90,000 articles from ERC projects published. And if you look at the very top 1%, the, the articles which are cited the most, the very top 1% cited articles, from the type of budget that you'd expect, we should have about 1% or 2% of those grants. If you look at the amount of money which is given for research in the world and how it equates to the numbers of publications, we have about 7% of those top 1% cited publications. Overall, there are about 40,000 researchers from all nationalities working on ERC grants as part of their teams. And we funded researchers from 67 different nationalities. Um, we have researchers from, uh, from Malaysia and from Singapore who are our, who are, are our grantees. We don't yet from Thailand, and we would certainly like to see that we'll have excellent ideas coming from Thailand and we can fund Thai researchers too. Now, we always end with some information. What I'd like to, to do is to look particularly at this video. Because sometimes the easiest way, after you've gone to a talk like this, is thinking, what did he say about this? So we've put together a video, doesn't involve me, but a video with a cartoon character. You see the researcher over here. And she will take you through in a step-by-step -step process of how you put, forward, put through forward your application. And our website has lots of information uh, that you need and how you put together applications. It also gives you testimonials from researchers who are not European about why they replied and what they have done with their, their grants of working within Europe. So I'll just to finish again with our websites and with more information about how you can get, um, you, with some more sites about how you can get more information from us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin, for that comprehensive overview of the ERC. As you can see, it's one of the, the more prestigious European funding programs that covers researchers at all stages of their career. There will be no Thai success stories yet, so hopefully somebody in this room will be that success story. So any, any questions from the audience? Yes. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, my name is Ahmad. Uh, I'm a student in King Mongkut uh, University of North Bangkok. Um, i really interested in your uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, even though uh, I'm still a master's student, but uh, I have dreamed to be a researcher in the future. Um, i really uh, attracted with the uh, ERC grants. Uh, so for that, uh, I have uh, three questions. Um, what is the grantee's uh, obligation, uh, responsibility, and the outcome that expected uh, from the ERC uh, mm -hmm. for doing the research for that? Mm -hmm. And uh, for the starter uh, grant, uh, like uh, two years after completion of the PhD, uh, 
if he got a uh, grants and if he success to uh, finish the research can he uh, extend uh, to be uh, in the consolidate sure. and what if he uh, failed the the research and got nothing like uh, because uh, in the research uh, we still not uh, we still don't know about the expectation about our results sure. whether it's good or not and is it okay to apply again even though we failed sure. for that times yeah okay now that those are really good questions I think first of all if you're a master student then the Araxis team can help you um, many of our, our grantees will have PhD positions which they'll be advertising on your access jobs and so there's already a way you've been involved in the ERC team now even before you know just going from your masters to your PhD so I think that's not the question that you asked but it's a way in which you could be involved already um, for the starting grantees what we expect is that you have a great idea and you can push back the frontiers of knowledge but we know that research is risky and so sometimes it doesn't work. That's how it is. You know, what we encourage all of our, our peer reviewers to look for is what we would call high risk, high gain research. So if it works, yes, this could be the most fascinating idea that you could imagine. But it may not work. But let's take that risk. Because if it does work, you know, we could change the world. And that's exactly what we ask. So it's not expected. We would like it that our research projects would, would always work, but we're realistic that sometimes research doesn't. We also want to make sure that researchers spend their time on carrying out the research. So you ask about the expectations. And often with granting schemes, I know from when I was an active researcher myself, you spend almost as much time in filling in reports about what you've done than actually doing the research. So we don't do that. We just ask for two very short reports, one at midterm, so if you have a five-year grant, you don't write anything to us at all about the research for the first two and a half years, and then one at the end. And so that's it, that's to be the expectations, and it's a form with a standard template and a lot of free text, but it's only twice that you have to report to us. Your host institution will take care of the finance, they will report on the financial aspects of it, you're a researcher, so you don't need to worry about having to sort out all of the finance. So it's they will also then reply, put reports on an 18-month basis on how you spent the money. You only have to report twice on, on the research. So if you've gone, gone through the process and got a starting grant, and it's this real high-risk, high-gain, and yes, it was a great idea, unfortunately it didn't work, you have another great idea, and at this point you're in the window for a consolidator grant, of course you can apply again. Many of our um, current consolidator grantees um, have had a, you're going through in the current round now, have had a starting grantee. Not all of them. Many people will start for their first ERC grant with a, with a consolidator grant or with an advanced grant. But we have examples of people who've had a starting grant, have finished it, and then gone on successfully to win, to win a consolidator grant. So yeah, both are possible. All right, thank you very much. Another question for Dr. Penny? I think a, this one here. I don't know oh, if those microphones are live, yeah. but I guess you can test. The policy is actually set out, first of all, within the um, overall decision on Horizon 2020. I'm getting into a lot of jargon here, but the easiest way of saying it is it's your intellectual property and we'd expect you to make best use of it. Um, of course, then it's working with your host institution within Europe so it could be used as, as much as possible within Europe. And if you want to license it outside of Europe, then it's the agreements that you'll come to, to with, you, with your host institution and with us uh, in that respect. But ultimately, we don't hold the IP. Why would we do that with the European Commission? You're the ones with the ideas. You're the ones which can use your IP to create companies, to create create spin-offs, to create jobs and employment and growth and all of the kind of things which, you know, our, our, our political speakers here are really interested in getting out of research. So you're the best people to deal with the IP, not us. Okay, well, Dr. Penny is going to be here for the rest of the day before he flies off this evening. So 
If you have other questions, please, please catch him in the coffee break or over lunch. Um, but please do take advantage of the fact that he's traveled a long way to be with us uh, today. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Yeah.